me just take a minute before we get going because we're, we're talking, we're, we're in our Faith and Hope series. And we're talking, about, we're talking about life from a spiritual perspective and oftentimes what's possible doesn't look anything like what we're currently experiencing and that's challenging, potentially offensive. And, and, but I would rather, rather than watering down what's potentially possible for us because of this spiritual life that is in us, Rather, rather than watering down the potential possibilities, I would rather stretch us out of our natural comfort into spiritual expectation, right? Amen. So let's just, let's just take a minute and just set our hearts on Him. Just relax. Take a deep breath. Let your body relax. You know, you, you hear God better when you're relaxed. Your body heals. It's, it's amazing what happens. We carry so much stress. And just put your attention on the awareness of the Lord, whether you use your visualization to get a mental picture or not, doesn't really matter. But just think about Him for just, just acknowledge His presence because He's the reason we gather. Jesus, You're the reason we gather. We acknowledge You. You're our Lord and our God and our King. You said that You no longer call us servants, but You call us friends. What an amazing concept. But I'm just thinking about you, right now, in this moment, in that heavenly holy of holies, interceding for us. You're in that heavenly dimension. We're connected by your spirit. And you're praying for us. So Jesus, we worship. Just worship him in your heart for just a minute. Jesus, we lift you up in this place. We put you front and center. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify you in our hearts. We trust you. We thank you. Jesus, we worship you. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. May the eyes of our heart be on you. Not on the world, but on you. And as we talk about faith today, from your words, from your perspective, the Holy Spirit being the teacher, we trust you. I'm just telling me, trust him. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. My heart is open to you. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. You know that I do that all the time. I just I just make it a practice to get to that place of peace, to get to that awareness of Him. Really, before I try to do anything, before I try to make any kind of decision, if I've got a life decision that I need to make, you know, just get into that place of peace, honoring Him, worshiping Him inwardly giving him place, man, I'm telling you, it, it, shift, it shifts things. It puts you in a place of hope and expectation. It, 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 it's a strength and power against temptation, you know? You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but you still have this mind and sometimes these desires in this world, and, and, but you don't have to give in to that stuff, you know? Because you have the spirit of the living God on the inside of you, You've got a new heart. He's changed you, and the rest of your being is being transformed into the image of Christ. You can stop and yield to that spiritual force of grace that's working on the inside of you, and it's stronger than any other desire that you might ever have. And, and I'm not just talking about emotional peace. I'm talking about the tangibility of spiritual peace, the gift, the fruit of the Spirit on the inside of you, the fruit of the Spirit on the inside of you. Because, you know, we, we, most of us have comfortable lives. We, everybody faces challenges and difficulties, and there's different degrees and levels of suffering. But then you do something like go to Mexico or inner, inner city or just any, anything. I mean, there, there's darkness anywhere and everywhere. <clears throat> but if we can learn how to get to that place of peace, none of that stuff invades, and then we have hope to bring to those places, to the nations, even in our own lives, you know, even in our own homes. And, and, you know, I've just got several ideas. I want to kind of put them out there, and then we'll slide into the, the passages I have for today. But I was thinking about, and we have a lot of conversations about, you know, the church and organizing and how to minister, certain kinds of things. We are a, we are a gifts-believing church, you know. We, we believe in the moving and activity of the Spirit in our lives. We, we believe in praying for one another and that miracles can happen. And, in fact, Jesus gave us the power to operate 
in his power in this earth. You know, it's, it's not us wielding some type of power by our own will. Like when it comes time to prophesy, it's not just that because you got God's spirit in you, anything that you say is a prophecy. I mean, you, we still yield to the leading of the spirit, right? Even Jesus said, I only do that which I see the Father doing. May that be true of us also. So, so I'm not talking about some hyper-charismatic expression of faith, but I do want to stretch into. But, but, but just on this idea of the Spirit, if you've said yes to Jesus, you have all of the Spirit that you will ever be able to receive from God. In other words, you don't get born again, and then if nobody led you in the baptism of the Spirit, in air quotes, then you have to get some other type of aspect of God later on that, 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 that's, that comes from a misunderstanding of the first time the Spirit was poured out in the upper room with the early church in the book of Acts. You can't take that one instance and then lay that on top of how the Spirit works from then on. When you say yes to Jesus, the fulfillment of the promise through Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the promise of the new covenant is God removes that root of sin, Colossians 2. He puts His Spirit in there. He gives you a new heart. Uh, the Holy Spirit baptizes you in the body of Christ, and Jesus baptizes you in the Spirit with fire. It's like it all happens together. Now, the caveat might be the being baptized in the Spirit has more to do with yielding to the Spirit that is within you to come upon you, to strengthen you and empower you, but, but I, I think the charismatic church has done a dis, disservice to Christianity at large in relegating baptism of the Spirit down to one thing, and that being the gift of tongues. Yep. Praying in tongues is, exact, it's, it's, is being baptized in the Spirit as much as it is operating in the gift of joy or operating in the fruit of joy, the fruit bearing the Spirit, bearing fruit, in you, coming upon you in joy and depression, you, you put it off. You know, patience. Experiencing the fruit of patience is just as being baptized or being experiencing being yielded to the Spirit as is praying in the Spirit. Are you with me? Yeah. And, and I think there's a lot of confusion in that. And I, and I think a lot of people minister it in such a way where we're looking at the externals and the effect rather than the spiritual truth of it. And the spiritual truth of it is when you say yes to Jesus, you get completely renewed and you're a new creature. And then whether you choose to pray in tongues or yield to the fruit of the Spirit in patience and joy and meekness and long-suffering and goodness and gentleness and all that stuff, it's really all the same thing. Now, the, that specific gift is a bit dynamic, and we're going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks. But I, don't know, I just wanted to put that out there because, you know, so many times believers are just led to believe that we lack something, and you don't. You don't. You are, literally, you are literally complete in Christ. Now, we still have some growing to do. We still have transformation to experience, but in your spirit, you're complete. Amen? And I, and I, think, that's, I think it's important to know that when we're talking about these kinds of things. Because in some circles, when we start talking about spiritual truth or operating the gift of faith, and, and, and I... I don't mean for this to just always go into miracles or supernatural, because like I said, experience, you know, faith working in your heart to access grace and experience the power of the Spirit in your life. If you, if you are facing a situation where you would typically blow up in anger or you're going to make a really bad decision, but yet you choose to let the Spirit bear the fruit of joy or patience on the inside of you, I'm telling you, that is just as spiritual as laying hands on the sick and seeing somebody recover. It's all the same thing. It's the power of the Spirit working in you to do a work in you, either in you or through you. It's all the same thing. So I don't want this to just be feel like a series where we're just trying to talk about doing a bunch of miracles. I think the church should be better at miracles. In fact, it's interesting. Jesus, I mean, constantly would, you know, he empowered his apostles, his disciples. They would go out. And when things didn't work, what did he say? Oh, you have little faith. Oh, you have little faith. Doubt not in your heart. Don't be double-minded. You bunch of perverts. (laughs) 
you know, we hear that word, we instantly think sexually, but it's like, it's perverting. I think doubt perverts what we believe to be possible, right? It's carnal thinking, right? Perversion in that you're not spiritual thinking. You've perverted spiritual thinking and it's carnal thinking or just physical thinking. So when we talk about some of these passages and we, we kind of challenge ourselves to step into an expectation of the impossible because that's what Jesus said. All things are possible for those who believe. The things that I do, you'll do. Right? It's like, man, but, but I'm unhappy. I don't like my job. I don't have a good marriage. I'd like to be married. I'm addicted to this. I'm a, you know, it's like, you want me to do miracles? What about all of this? And, and it's like, I'm just going to say it. A lot of times in those hyper-charismatic circles, there's so much focus on the lofty things that a lot of the character and integrity foundation doesn't get developed. And I'm not attacking any kind of group, but I just think the church needs to grow up. Grow up. And it's not that you got to get this stuff in place before you do this. It's not one or the other. It's like as the Spirit works transformation in your life, you experience the fruit of the Spirit. You become more patient, more kind, more loving, more wise, and walking in the power of the Spirit more in, in its multifaceted expression. So I, I, it's like I'm not trying to just focus on one section of experiencing the power of the Spirit. Even though we might just talk about one section today, when, when we talk about, because we're going to read some passages about Peter walking on water, while that is a, that's, I mean, that's really cool, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't want to walk on water? But, but also think about Peter beholding Jesus. Jesus is standing on the water. Peter steps out onto the water, walks on the water, also translates to you breaking the power of temptation in your life. It's the same thing. It's depending on the power of the Spirit and whatever it might be. And it takes faith to access that grace that works on the inside of you, that power. To walk on water or to be patient or to be kind or to be wise with your finances or to discern the leading and the direction and the will of God for your life. It's all the same, right? So having set that stage, I want to read, <clears throat> you know, in this, in this series, we're calling it um, Faith and Hope. And just a few passages we've looked at here in Ephesians 1.17, anchoring in this that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, I, I can't help it. Every time I read, I just want to go slow because it's like the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. I just kind of want to stop and worship for a minute, you know. I mean, really. But recognizing who he is, honoring who God is in this moment, that he may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so this whole thing that we're talking about these few weeks is wisdom, which is the practical aspect of applying the word of God, revelation, which is the living aspect that you don't necessarily discern from the written word, but it's that living aspect of God leading you and guiding you because he is active. So wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's, it all anchors back into him. Your wisdom should anchor into him and your revelation should anchor into him. So if you want to know what's the wise thing to do, you filter it through what he's accomplished, what he promises for you, what do I know about Jesus, what has he made available, what does he, ex what does he expect from me. You know, you answer the question in this moment, what does he want for me and what does he want from me? And you need wisdom to take some steps, and then you need revelation to be led and be empowered in those moments. So it's all about being anchored in Him. If we get something that we can't necessarily find in Scripture, I'm not talking about new revelation or new doctrine. I just mean the specifics for your situation. And you're confused about it, go back to Jesus, and, 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 and that will be the ground which the Holy Spirit will use to help you anchor your revelation into wisdom. Are you with me? All right. So 
And then Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. What things not seen? The things that we need revelation for. The things that God would lead us to do. The operating in the gifts. The application of wisdom to step into those callings that he has for our life. Those assignments, whether it be a lifelong arc or one day assignments or one week assignments or two year assignments, whatever they might be, right? Um, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It might even be a physical healing. You're hoping for that. Jesus paid for that. But faith is the substance of the thing not seen, the evidence of the thing not seen. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand. I mean, even that, think about that. By faith we understand. Well, God, I just don't know. I wish you'd just make it clear. Well, by faith we understand. What is faith? Faith is to be persuaded of, to be convinced of. It's just trust. Faith is just trust. So oftentimes faith is, I don't understand what to do in this situation, so I need some wisdom and revelation. So I'm going to go into the scripture. I'm going to find out what your word says about this area of life, and I'm going to obey your word just plain and simple. I'm going to do your word in my actions and in my thoughts. And as I do that, I'm expecting revelation to bring it alive to show me what your spirit would lead aside from just one-for-one -one obedience, right? Is this making sense? And then the question kind of centering around all this is how will you prioritize hope in God's promises and purposes for your life this year? You know, so we're answer, answering the question. And I think all of us that are serious about our faith, it's like, okay, I, I, I want to know what God wants from me. But I also want to experience what he wants for me. And, and I think sometimes the body of Christ can focus too much on one side or the other, right? The more denominational sola scriptura mindset is I, want, I just want to live in the fulfillment of what God wants from me. Uh, not neglecting what he wants for me, but almost just in a, let me just keep going. So today, this idea of water walking faith versus sinking doubt. Water walking faith versus sinking doubt. Let me just read. Um, let, me, let me give you this picture. I posted this picture on social media this week. and it, Can you see it? Is it dark? It's a picture of a tree growing through a rock, and the tree, as it has grown, has broken the rock apart. This is, a, this is an animated image that kind of gives it it's a little bit better, you can see. So the roots down there, and we know that what happened here uh, is the seeds were in the ground, ungerminated, before the concrete was laid on top, but once the seed started to grow, and grow and grow and grow, it breaks apart whatever's on top of it. Now, the seed could have been dropped. I know you technically minded, well, it could have been dropped there after the con. Well, you know, whatever, it could have been dropped there. But the point being, the seed over time is stronger than something that seems impossible to break. You take a, and, and this, is the, this is the picture that I think Jesus is giving us about faith. Because he says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, he's not necessarily talking about the size of the faith, but he's talking about how do you think faith works? How do you think the kingdom works? This is how the kingdom works. It's planted. You're, it's in you. You're in it. And the, the, as you give it time to grow, and sometimes that's the supernatural. It's instant growth, right? Instant healing, instant provision, instant this, whatever. That can happen because in that spiritual dimension, there is no time. And we can experience spirit in this temporal plane. And it works the same way. So the concept is not the size of the seed as much as it is how does the kingdom work. And we talked last week about a couple of different passages. Jesus gave the example of a woman who takes a lump of dough and folds yeast into it, leaven into it, and, and then eventually the leaven works its way through the whole lump of dough so that it becomes something that becomes useful and edible. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is in you because Christ is in you. And what is he doing? He is conforming you into his image. As long as your heart is open and receptive, 
by faith toward him to allow him to do that on the inside of you. And I, I, that, that's, that's the difference. That's the, that's the part of faith allowing the kingdom to grow. And that, that's the part that the Holy Spirit has to teach you how to do that. Nobody, I, I can't teach you how to do that, even when, Mark, even when Jesus teaches it in Mark 4, which we're actually going to go through next week. Um, he, he, you know, and I say it all the time, but it's just such an aspect of, of how to understand how to engage faith Uh, It's something that is growing, and like this seed that as it grows into a tree breaks apart the concrete, so does the kingdom break apart your addictions, your fear, your anxiety. But you have to host it, right? And that's when he goes through and he teaches about the parable. You can't pluck the word out. You can't let double-mindedness creep in. You can't let doubt creep in. (laughs) Kraut. I personally like spicy kraut, but reminds me of my Athens days hot dog stand, spicy kraut. Anyway, so let's look at a couple of passages. I mean, that, that, that's basically what I want to say today, but I want to read a few passages to you to kind of just solidify more of this idea of how Jesus talks about it. Because this idea of faith. This idea of the expectation of the kingdom doing something on the inside of you, doing something in your life, your life matching kingdom. I thought we were going (laughs) to... I was waiting for the next one. Are are you with me? Like like I'm I'm, I'm hearing, I'm I'm like preaching to myself inwardly as I'm pausing because I'm trying to... I I just want to paint this picture with words to the degree where our expectation is the kingdom is in me and it's growing. And it's like not just a single root, but, but leaven working through my entire being as I open my heart. And how do you open you? You worship him. You put his word first. You, 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 you humbly submit and be willing to just simply obey his word. Not to try to earn something, not to try to become something more or to get something from him. But because as you're receptive to him, his kingdom overtakes every aspect of your being. And you can't explain it. You can't make it happen. Faith is not what you do to get the kingdom to grow. Faith is not what you do to get God to do things for you. Faith is willingly, receptively hosting his word and being willing to put it into practice. It's it's as if, you guys remember the Indiana Jones movie where he gets to the one point and, he's, and he gets to this, cab, this, this cave, and there's a giant chasm, but he's got to go across the chasm, and it's like the, 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 the indication is, take the first step. And it's like he closes his eyes, you know, and he just, he thinks he's going to, and boom, he hits it, and then when he changes his perspective, he sees the support there, right? And that's what we were talking about last week. We need a perspective shift, and to a new vantage point, like, like if I'm, this is my perspective, this is my vantage point, and I have this perspective. If I move over here, I have a new vantage point, well, this is my perspective. I can see something over there that I didn't previously see, right, which might be life-giving for me. Your vantage point must be <laughs> seated in Christ, hidden in God. You are seated with Christ. That's your vantage point, seated with Christ, Right? when you face life and when you deal with everything else. So keep all that in mind as we look at some of these passages. Um, Eric, would you follow me along, please, uh, so I can just read through these. And I'm going to go kind of quick, but let these speak to you. And keep in mind, this is Jesus speaking about faith. I forgot to read this one, starting here. Luke 17, 5 and 6. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Would you say that? Increase our faith. That's what, like their mindset was give me more faith. And what did he say? I think he was changing the perspective on it, changing it to the seed mindset. It's not something that you need more of. It's something that you need to host the growth of. He says, uh, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a, as a mustard, as a mustard seed, some translations say the size of a mustard seed. I personally don't think that that's 
proper. I think it's how it works, not how much of it you have. But if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted, and it would obey you. So faith, anchoring to receive grace, to experience the growth of the kingdom in your life. Faith is trusting that his word is smarter than you. Trusting that as he shapes new desires in you, they're better than your desires. Trusting that as he gives you ideas for your life, they're better than your ideas. That, that's, that's the hard part of humility. But God, I really want to do this. No, let me just, I know you do. I know you do. But this is better. Trust me. Oh, grace. Yes, no, you were, you were right. I don't know what I was thinking. That's repentance. So here we go. This, this is interesting. This is like the day in the life of Jesus. Jesus finds out that his cousin, probably cousin, John the Baptist, got killed. So he um, goes off to, in a boat to go um, pray and just grieve, right? Grieve his loss. He comes back, and there's a whole multitude of people gathered at the seashore, and he goes to the seashore to heal them. He heals all of them, or heals, you know, it says all of them. And then it gets late, and so, you know, it's the whole thing about the two fish and the five loaves of bread. And so Jesus challenges his disciples. They don't know how to do it. It's an object lesson. He feeds, it says 5,000 men besides the women and the children. So 20, 30,000 people there, you know. They didn't have TV back then, so they had a lot of kids. But probably 30, 40. <laughs> I'm going to... That was a delayed laugh. I know I'm going too fast when it's like, all right. Anyway, 20,000 people he feeds after grieving, after healing all of them. He sends them away, goes up to the mountain to pray. And at night, so at some point, it says that he's far away from them, but he, sees, he sends his disciples on. He's far away from them, and he sees the disciples ahead of him. So he goes to them across the water. And this, this is what we're going to read. This is, this is the same day all this happened at night, the day in the, li day in the life of Jesus, right? So this, this is what's... And I'm going to read this uh, story from Matthew and Mark. And I want you to notice how it's, they tell the story differently. Like they each have their perspective of what happened. And there's something really interesting that Mark leaves out um, and I don't know why, I don't think it's significant necessarily, but it's interesting. All right, so here's Matthew, Matthew 14, 22. And we're going to go all the way through 35. Immediately, just think about this. He's probably still feeling the pain of knowing that John the Baptist was beheaded, right? He probably, he grew up with him. This is a friend of his. This is who he, he knew is. Think about that. He's still grieving. They found out that morning. Fed... You get the point. Let's go. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, what time? Does anybody know what time that is? Shortly before dawn. Shortly before dawn. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Say, walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. You've got a sea raging on the inside of you. He can walk on it and calm it. They were troubled, saying, it's a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, don't be afraid. That's like always the message, don't be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it's you. It's, it's, all these little things, and Lord, if it's you. I mean, he thinks it's a ghost. He's like, I think you might be Jesus, but I think you also might be a ghost. So if it's Jesus... <laughs> Command me to come on to you on the water. Now, what did Jesus say? No, 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 no. I'm the Son of God. 
it is only for I to display such amazing works of power. No, 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 no. This is only for me to be able to manipulate matter and walk on water. Are you with Because Because these are the things that get taught. Well, he's the son of God, so he could do it. But, yeah, but what's it? his willingness is, come on. Into the impossible. Come on. Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on, leave it on this. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. I mean, I don't, I don't, I kind of want to just let it sit because when I was going through this, uh, really over the last couple of weeks, man, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is just, and it's not even intellectual teaching. It's that thing that the Holy Spirit does on the inside of you in regard to faith. I, I'm not trying to put a nice little bow on this and tell you what faith is supposed to be. I just kind of want to take these in and think about it. Let, it. let it resonate. And then what insights come up out of it for you? That, I do that with the Word all the time. I'm not, and I'm not trying to get a special revelation and say, well, this is what this really means. No, I, I, I want it to settle in and hit home. I want it to change how I think, how I feel, what I expect. And, and watching Peter step out on the water and legit walk on the water. Again, I'm not just talking about walking on water. I'm not just talking about miracles. We're talking about the, in the empowerment of the Spirit for whatever area of life that you might need. The impossible can happen. You're facing a situation, this relationship. I, just, I don't see how this can change, but it can. I don't see how I could ever overcome this addiction. I don't see how I, my life could ever be different than this that it is because it's just, it's just the way it is. It is what it is. Well, that's sinking doubt, not water-walking faith. The impossible can happen because the Spirit of the living God. And there's not that many areas of life that we need to experience it. Your health, your relationships, your finances, you know, we don't need that much. We're not that unique and special. We're just humans. There's not a whole lot that you need. It's not that complicated. He walked on the water to go to Jesus, 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Fear, fear kills faith. Fear kills faith. And beginning to sink, beginning to sink. You, you ever stepped on water? You don't begin <laughs> to sink. You sink. Because he was walking and began. Now, what if he'd taken his eyes off the waves back onto Jesus? Probably would have come right on back up to the top of the water, right? Yeah. I think so. Fear kills faith. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me, which is what we do. I'm afraid, save me. And what does Jesus say? Oh, it's okay. What does Jesus say? Stretch out his hand, saved him. Yeah, so immediately stretched out his hand, caught him, said to him, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Leave it there. What? What? That's his response. That's challenging. That's offensive. He's walking on water. Am I just having fun with this, or is this are you yeah, kind of is the Holy Spirit stirring this up in you? If you if you kind of feel like okay, yeah, you're being stretched, raise your hand at me. I just want to know. Yeah, half of you are like, just hurry up. I got something to eat. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, this is the way I do it. This is the way that I read the Word. I'm just going. I'm I'm taking it slow, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, man, 
I want to entertain the possibilities of what the Spirit can do. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? All right. When they got in the boat, the winds, when, yeah, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I, I would think so. I would think so. <laughs> and then the Mark account. Mark is, you know, Mark is for the Ds, if you know about the disc profile. Mark is like power, power, miracle, 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 details, meh, power, 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 <laughs> direct, direct, direct. So jump over to the Mark account. Mark 6, 45, beginning, immediately Jesus went, uh, made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left. I mean, it's like, we healed everybody, we fed everybody, now go, right? <laughs> Bid, go. He, there, he left for the mountain to pray. Again, probably to continue to grieve and then get leading from the Lord. So when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea. He was alone. Now pay attention. This, this is funny to me. It's interesting. I don't know why it is this way, but it is. This is Mark's account. Same account, right? This is in a different time. Same account. And he was alone on the land, seeing them straining at oars, for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and he, atten he intended to pass by them. I'm not going to make a big deal about that. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke with them and said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Everything tracks. Then he got in the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. What's missing? Peter walking on the water. I know, it's interesting, right? But you would expect that, people that had been to a certain, for, for some reason, that part wasn't all that, that necessary for Mark to put in there. I, I don't know why. I don't want to try to make it, but it's interesting. So you, you would think he'd put that in there. But what I think is, what he was mostly focused on was the lesson of Jesus and how he felt about that whole instance, I think this is personally, Mark was focused on it. He wasn't thinking about Peter necessarily, although as amazing as that might have been, I think he was taking this personally, and this is his conclusion. They had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. Another translation says, that Jesus even says to them, you didn't consider the miracle of the loaves. Faith entertains when God moves. Faith entertains and thinks about and ponders on other times you've experienced his working in your life. Faith sets up a monument and celebrates when God does something in your life. And really, the greatest thing from the teachings of Jesus that should instill faith in us for future scenarios is that he died and resurrected for us. The power of his resurrection working in us should be the greatest faith builder that we have because of his love for us because of renewing us. That should eradicate all... Of it. The fact that, the, that God emptied himself, became human, lived perfectly to be the sacrifice for your sin, to on that cross take all your shame, guilt, tried and punished for your sin, go into the grave and conquer every dark force and even the power of eternity without God conquered that, and then rose again, and then offers to you salvation in faith, by grace through faith in what he did. That, to me, should be the biggest thing that stirs up faith on the inside of us, right? But he says the reason they were afraid was that they didn't get insight from the miracle of the loaves. That speaks to me. We should ponder and meditate and think about and you, you don't, it doesn't have to be necessarily your life. I hope that it is. I hope that you have things in your life. And I'm not even talking necessarily about miracles. Ultimately, it's even just salvation. For me, I don't, it's just like watching your children be born. It, it, it's like, how can you possibly deny there is a loving God that designed family and, and all that that goes into 
Man. So, let's jump to Mark eleven twenty. Now in the morning, as they pass, this is after he goes past. He's hungry. He sees the fig tree. Doesn't have fruit on it. He curses the fig tree. They come back. Now in the morning, as they pass by, they saw the fig tree um, dried up from the roots. Follow me there, please. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. It's a faith issue. Again, for assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain. Now, obviously, he's, this is an object lesson to apply on to life broader. But he's talking about the power of, the word, of his words also. Uh, so I'll say to this mountain, be removed, cast in the sea. And I'm not saying you can just declare something and make it happen. We're, again, we're talking about faith as a seed, entertaining the growth of the kingdom within you, making sure that you're anchored in God's wisdom, his biblical wisdom, with revelation, brought together in the knowledge of Christ. As you see, I mean, I'm trying to kind of put it together in what faith is doing. So for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. Say, does not doubt in his heart. Does not doubt in his heart. That, that's huge. That's huge. Why do some people get healed and some people don't? Doubt, doubt in the heart. Yeah. Why are some people experiencing financial blessing? It's not because they give more than the other person. And when I say financial blessing, I'm talking about God being your provider, blessing you exceedingly, abundantly above. Going to Scripture. I'm just looking at Scripture. God exceedingly, abundantly above, blessing you all that you can ask or imagine. Why? And that's tied back to God's promise to Abraham that his descendants would be a blessing in the earth. And how did God bless Abraham? Incredible wealth. Not Again, you know, you know where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to preach prosperity gospel, but blessing so that you can be a blessing. Faith. Not try to faith to get God to move and get something, and I'm going to give, and I'm going to work the seed, and I'm going to work the law, and I'm going to get to, and God's got, and it's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to keep my heart open, which is what giving does, and I hope that you give. I don't teach tithe. I teach generosity. Generosity is a willingness to give out of your natural means, and, and the biblical model would be give a fixed percentage of your income regularly to support the work of the ministry and to cultivate generosity and out of respect and honor to God, right? Not so that God will continue to re rebuke the devourer for you. The devourer has already been rebuked. Not to try to, you know, keep from getting cursed. Christ was cursed on your behalf. If you don't tithe, you're not cursed. If you don't tithe, you're not cursed. Because Christ would curse for you. So we want to cultivate generosity. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe that those things he say will come to pass. He will have whatever he says. That, that, that's what? That, that's incredible. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. James 1, 5, almost done. Last passage. And then I'm going to give you the definition of doubt. Then we're going to pray. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. He ain't going to make you feel bad if you ask. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith. Ask in faith. Ask with expectation. That's back to that Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is expectation. Hope, have trust expectantly in what's legally right for you to be able to ask for from God because of what Christ paid for, right? Not making up your own stuff. So for he who doubts is like a wave, is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Now, let me give you this definition of doubt. I don't have a slide for it, so. Um, <clears throat> doubt. There's a couple different words. It means waver. It means twice. It means again. So doubt not in your heart. You know, James 1 says to be double-minded is to be unstable. He even says, don't let that person, that person shouldn't expect to receive any. If you're double-minded, you shouldn't expect to receive anything from God. 
I'm not talking about legalistic behavior. I'm talking about a heart of faith toward God. Double-mindedness, you shouldn't expect any to receive it. You shouldn't expect to receive from Him. I'm telling you, man, most people, are, we're all double-minded. We've got to get doubt out of the heart. So it means to separate. Doubt means to separate. I, I, when I hear this description, I hear Adam and Eve eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were making distinctions, making separations. Maybe God didn't tell me the truth. Maybe there is still something. Maybe there's a way apart from His way, right? Maybe, maybe what I understand, I can do it my own way. Maybe, maybe what I understand apart from who God and what God is, it's like we develop this twice-mindedness, this again. Well, let me think about that. God says, well, no, let me think about that again. And you add in circumstance, your understanding. Are you with me? This is doubt. It means separate, make a distinction, discriminate, prefer, withdraw from one, separate oneself in a hostile spirit, oppose, strive to dispute, contend. It gets more aggressive, right? It's like at first it's like, mm -hmm. and, and see, here's the problem. When we're living in a specific emotional reality, in other words, what you're going through in life is real. You're not, doubt, you're not denying what you're going through. It's real. That develops a mindset, an emotional reality. you got a choice to make. Can you harness your emotions, deal with them, rein your thoughts in, deal with them, rein your behavior in, deal with it, Align it with the Word of God, get the doubt out, obey, not to try to earn, but to just keep yourself open to Him, right? You can expect to receive all these things like Jesus, whatever you ask, then, then whatever you ask, you shall receive. Really? Really? Yeah, He said that. In line with the Word of God, in line with what Jesus paid for, that's what he's inviting us into. Are you with me? Amen. Now, I mean, I'm going to give you some homework. Go home and take this and apply it to your life. Think about where, where can I put this into my life? Is Chris still here? Can you come and play a little bit? Can we get the keys up? I'll just play a little bit. And we'll just worship and meditate for just a minute. I know we're going a little bit long, but I just kind of want this to... You know, just imagine the kingdom on the inside. So just, 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 just another couple of minutes. Just imagine the kingdom is inside. Because Jesus said, kingdom doesn't come with outward observation. It's on the inside of you. This picture that we had about the roots breaking up the rock. Just think about that for a minute as we pray. Father, we thank you. We trust you. We love you. Jesus, we acknowledge that you said your kingdom doesn't come with outward observation, but it's within us. We are in the kingdom, and the kingdom is in us, and we choose to have faith like a seed. Faith to access this grace. Now just get a picture in your mind, in your heart, like Jesus gives us the word picture of the yeast working its way through the dough. Just get a picture of the Holy Spirit working His way through your emotions, through your choices, where you're tempted. This, is, this can be a, and I'm not going to ask you to go too deep into this now, but this can be a very powerful exercise that you do. You recognize an area that you struggle, and when you're not struggling, you sit down and you acknowledge it, you own it, and you be willing to change. You acknowledge that area of weakness and temptation where you just love that sin, but it's killing you. You can sit down, connect to God, and, and just see yourself being empowered by the Spirit in that moment where you just walk away from it victoriously because the grace on the inside of you will strengthen you to do so. So just acknowledge the kingdom of heaven is in me. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed growing in me, transforming me and shaping me into the image of Christ. I put off the old man and I put on the new man created 
in righteousness and true holiness because that's the work of God. And just acknowledge I yield to the kingdom in me. I yield to God's ways on the inside of me. God be glorified. Jesus be glorified as we worship. Not just worship Him, just, just acknowledge Him as Lord, Creator. Jesus, thank You. Thank You, Father. We honor You in this place. Be glorified. How majestic You are. Our powerful One, Almighty, All-Knowing. I yield to You. I submit to You. I want to walk with you. I want to follow you. I want to accomplish the purposes you have for my life. He's telling me, trust him. I trust you, Lord. I trust that your spirit is... A, and, and be willing to step into it. See, because what will happen is, as you make room for the spirit to move in your life, you got to be willing to step into the strength that's created for you in that moment. I hope that makes sense to you. When, you're, when you have the opportunity to choose one thing or the other, I hope that you are committed to stepping into the grace for that situation. And that, that means making hard decisions. That means knowing the Word of God, knowing by wisdom what step to take, but trusting that in Revelation you'll take that step. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, all right. Let's stand up if you would. Our prayer team would come up. If anybody in here has prayer needs at all, just make your way up and we want to believe with you. That's, that's what the body does. We help each other experience the powerful Spirit of God on the inside of us. And if you're in this room today and you've never said yes to Jesus and you want to make Him your Lord in this on this day, <laughs> start thinking about something else. And you know, if you're not sure that you're born again, this, if you would, just lift up your hand. Just wave at me. And I know that there's people online all the time. So if you're in this room and you're thinking you want to make that decision, or if you're watching online, go to our website, forward.church. Right on the homepage, we walk you through what, what that is. Just one last time. Thank you, Father. Just set your attention on Him. Say, I will walk by faith. One more time. I will walk by faith and not by sight, as the Spirit strengthens me and leads me to glorify God. Amen, amen, amen. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything He did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate His principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, His grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? 
then visit forward.church/connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.